Hello, everybody, and welcome to Between Two Fans. Your fans, DVP and Dan Scholz, are back for another blockbuster episode of Olympic action. Springboks are back in action. The Proteas are back in action with Test Cricket. You know, next week, I mean, I can barely say my side, but at the moment, next week, we get to do all of that. I get to say all of that, and I also get to throw in, uh, uh, well, we move on to the Paralympics, but I get to throw in some Premier League football as well. So, um, I hope everybody... That is next week. No. Um, I never thought I'd say this, I need a break. I need a break. <laughs> no, it's a lie. It's yeah. a lie. It's a flat I, hope, lie. I, hope everybody, I hope everybody's enjoyed what is what, what is the closest we're going to get to a sporting off-season because things are back <laughs> and ramping up hectically uh, in, in the coming months. But uh, before we get into the predictions and, and the various different stuff, we're going to talk to you about um, is Tatiana Schoolmarker Smith, um, her, the fact that she's retired, adding a, another medal to her name. We'll talk about Connie Sambini, um, always the bridesmaid, continues to be the bridesmaid. We were talking a bit about, um, obviously, the box squad that was announced today and um, so lots to come in the show mr dan scott who is currently still in the uk before going over to uh paris this weekend how are you how are things going how's the prep going prep is a1 i've got the flag ready it's it's there we packed, go. folded it's even been given an iron it's 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 ready for a big day out um i couldn't be more excited to jump on that eurostar touchdown in paris just Get a couple baguettes. I'm, I'm taking my little um, book beret. I probably should be wearing it now. Alas, yeah, um, yeah. I'll be, I'll be shouting out all the, all the um, names of the South African competitors that are left at that point, which we're not quite sure how many there will be. But mm. one for sure is absolutely Khada Stain. So Khada, if you're listening, fan of the show, we here, maybe, perhaps, um, <laughs> we will be on the sideline. So look out for Correct. that South African flag. We'll be supporting. Right, there we go. Right, so then that, before we go into the detail and various things, shall we dive into our predictions? Now, for those of you who don't know, we do have a, a prediction segment of the show every week where the two of us give our incredibly ill-informed opinion on uh, what is happening in the weekend. We we make some predictions, and uh, they very rarely come through um, true, but it's about who is the least far who, off who, it, really. Who's least bad? It's, it's yeah, not about it winning, it's about not losing. Um, correct, correct. And and the stakes are the first person to do 15 points. So we win 15 points um, means that the other person has to do an episode in a rival sporting jersey. So Dan's, Dan's in lining up an Arsenal one for me. I'm between an All Blacks or an England jersey. For example, for Dan, there's, there's, there's some big chats to be made in the next few weeks regarding what's going to happen there. So Dan, would you like to t- take us through the predictions? I would, Stevie. I would. And just to count... Um, we'll catch people up rather. It's 13 12 to Stevie going into this um, this week. And it was a, a nail biter this week as well. Let's get into it. First of all, we predicted the men's hockey, Stevie, and uh, their, predi- their position in the group and whether they'll get out of it or not. My prediction was fourth. And with that, would have come sneaking through the group into the quarterfinals. Your prediction was fifth. They ended up with fifth only ending up with the one win, which was a nice win, 5-2 versus France. A bit of a disappointing campaign for both men's and women's hockey for South Africa, where back in Tokyo, they really looked like they had announced themselves to like at that next level, able to compete in the top eight. Mm. Unfortunately, not to be um, this year. But Stevie, you go up with a 1-0 lead there. Next, we go on to Prudence Sekhudiso in the 800 meter. And my prediction was eighth, and your prediction was fourth. And I tell you what, you were right for about 95% of that race. Yeah. Um, but ending up, where eighth. You mentioned we, we, we're not making very good predictions. Both of ours have been exactly on the money. Yeah, I, yeah well, this is, I actually might have to have, I actually have to slide into her DMs because I, I think she had the capacity to, to finish <laughs> at least fifth. <laughs> you know, I, I think, I think, I mean, she, she ran herself. I mean, it was, it was such a heroic effort to try and stay with the top three and try and get into that medal position. And you yeah. can just see she ran out of steam. And I think it was almost a certain amount of, she was almost resigned to the fact that she couldn't medal and she kind of just dropped back. Um, I personally think she had enough in her to get the fifth place, which would have given me uh, <laughs> the win. So, yeah. So I might have to and say, listen, I know next time it's disappointing not to get the medal, but, but there are bigger just, things on the yeah, line here. The yeah, Olympic medal, yeah. you know. <laughs> there are the between two fans predictions riding on that uh, performance. I needed a fifth place from her. 
No, we, we, we really, unfortunately, slid into her DMs and told her about this. I, I've congratulated her and thanked her. Um, you know, we, we speak like that. Um, yeah. Stevie, then it came down to the final prediction. Akani Sambine, the mm. man of the hour. And your prediction was a fifth. Mine was a third. He came in fourth. Now, that might we might just want to call it square. I'd also like to argue that he was closer to third than he was to fifth. So I no. don't know how he's splitting <laughs> hairs here. <laughs> zero, zero chance that you're trying to get away with that one. You're not allowing that. We usually go on points difference. This is like time difference. You know? No, you get no eh? way. It's, especially, you're, not, you're definitely not going to argue that on the, the closest 100 meter like of all time, basically. Well, exactly. If anyone deserved, no. if anyone was no. closer to that third position, he would have got, he would have got, um, Bronze at the last Olympics had he just run. Uh, that doesn't, it, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You know, okay. Okay. Well, in that case, we just we've just kicked the can down the road. Another yeah. week, no score change. So I, I think you've gotten lucky there with that that prediction. Because well, I mean, we can award each other each a point and make uh, this week the week potentially you might lose this. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. <laughs> Easy for you to say, brother. Easy yeah, for exactly. you. Exactly. No, Give thank it. you. I will not be taking that. Um, but yeah, so it stays at 13-12. On to the next week. The race to 15 is heating up. But Stevie, let's jump into the rugby action. And before we go into the Springbok lineup for this week, let's quickly cover a bit of the Curry Cup. Yeah, look, uh, Curry Cup is well and truly underway. We, we're reaching the, the halfway point of, of the competition, which is which is really, really cool. Uh, yeah, and... Um, it's uh, it was an interesting weekend because it started all off with a draw um, between the cheetahs and the bulls, which is a big result for the cheetahs who got hammered by the bulls a couple of weeks before. Um, that has opened up the the log quite a bit. So mm. uh, thirty four all there, very interesting result. Um, the pumas uh, also joined to the sharks forty four. All, I mean, we don't see lots of draws in rugby. No. We saw two this weekend, I mean, that, and not pumas showing draws. Game. That pumas yeah, shark game and everything. Puma's going way ahead. They, they, they'll feel they had that one in the bag, but then they had to yeah. make the kick in extra time to actually get the draw in the end. How do they break up again? Absolutely. I think this is the thing. You know, if you want to watch rugby in terms of just sheer ridiculousness, you know, the Curry Cup is your competition to go to. Yeah. It's it's just, it's got everything. It's got yeah, it's it's got drama, it's got points, it's got tries, it's got it's it's everything. From a from a from a product point of view, if it wasn't no, deemed right a there. second tier competition, for example, and and people didn't view it as like this sort of lower rank thing because of the 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 lack of sort of spring marks in your normal URC players, from a product point of view, it's a hell of a lot of fun. Um, it's very it's cool, right? And also, so how many transfers do you see in signings? Do you see made? post the curry cup season and someone having a hell of a um couple yeah games. that's what we're yeah. now starting to see now a period Dianti starting to cook at 13 day we believe the return is on and peter gamedi kind of falling from the wayside all of a sudden putting his hand up and reminding everybody what he's yeah. all about Emil khan down at in the western province he's having mm -hmm. a great season even the new names like um lorenzo julius lorenzo yeah so, um, and under 20s so. putting their hands up yeah yeah so no, no been... it, it is a great competition. It is really good. Um, and yeah, more. I mean, more fixtures this weekend. We got the Lions. Oh well, the, the, we've got the final final two uh, results just quickly before you go in there, Dan. Oh, the Lions got back to winning ways against Greek. Because I need to just slide that in there because you know. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to I'll brush over that. that. Yeah, no, 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 no. We can't afford to. to Correct. And the West Pirates supporters also finally have some reason to celebrate when they got to win 39-17 right. over the Griffins. They're having a pretty poor season, so very important um, oh, for them. Right. right now, Dan, you can tell me all about this weekend. Yeah, Stevie, this weekend we have the Golden Lions hosting the Pumas, looking to go um, bring their away form to their form mm. at home, having lost to the Sharks uh, when they were last at home. Then it's the Top of the table, Bulls versus the bottom of the table, Griffins. Tough away fixture there for the Griffins. Um, their point seven is really sitting at negative 177. But listen, if there's a time to turn the campaign around, this is it. And then mm -hmm. uh, Tester for Province, who will be hosting um, Free State che Cheetahs. They are second on the log and just exuding the 
um, quality that they always seem to show in the Curry Cup. It's going to be a tough task for problems to keep them out. And then Sharks versus Griquas, which honestly could just be a roll of the dice, sitting in six yeah. and seven, not really um, looking all that impressive. But I think Griquas have always got a little flash in the pan and, 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 you know, they'll come at you for 20 minutes and all of a sudden score three <laughs> tries and you don't know what's quite happened. So um, exciting all round and it'll be interesting to see how this this log shapes up after this weekend yeah i think the greek was beating the sharks in 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 kimberley where the sharks had uh andre estes and trevor nikani apple yeah. fasti so yeah, a lot for the sharks team had all the yeah yeah exactly. yeah exactly so uh we'll have trevor nikani at their disposal but um, we'll not have andre estes and all napoli fasti and the likes so mm. yeah but in terms of the log there bulls currently sitting top of the log with 21 points the next three all tied on points actually with 18 that is the Cheetahs, Lions, and Pumas. It is done on points difference. Cheetahs with the 72 points difference. Lions 62, Pumas way back with 16. Uh, so in terms of points difference, Cheetahs and Lions are sitting pretty comfortably above uh, Pumas there. They've got 18 points. Then there's a five-point gap between them and Province. Sharks down at 12. Greek was at eight. And Griffins with just the two points so far. So a paint of Curry Cup action. But the thing that we're really looking forward to this weekend, Dad, is the start of the rugby championship cool. and uh yeah that we, we, we and we, we've got a lot to talk about when it comes to rugby championship first we've got a swim team to talk about as well as the sands are law variations Massive. um which are horrendous and um we've also then obviously got new zealand versus argentina to talk about this weekend um is that in new zealand in, or is it in argentina in new zealand um, oh, in new zealand. Are, they, are they also doing back to back in new zealand yeah Shit. um the argentina here huh? Yeah, no, no, tough, tough a times. bit of the shaky home series versus a C team France. So yeah, um, that, that that that's going to be a tough test. But Stevie, let's get straight into the starting lineup for this weekend. And it's let me just quickly run through um, the twenty three: Oxen Chair, Bongi Manambi, France Mohaba in the front three. We've got Eben Etzebeth and Arches Neyman in the locks. Captain Siakalisi, Peter Steptoy, and Ulrich Lowe starting. I believe his first game at number eight, but. Big for him because yeah. he wasn't in that initial squad um, to be picked for the box. Didn't even come to the UK, for example, to play that Wales game. Um, although he was actually with the Bulls then, so he wouldn't have been able to. Um, nine, Corbus Reinach, the experienced head with the new Sasha Feinberg, Gomez Zulu, 10, his first start in a box jersey. The usual wings of Curly Aronson, Cheslin Colby, and the usual centers of Damien Dillon and Jesse Creel with the another experienced head at the back. Philly LaRue, who is back from his concussion. Stevie, let's start with what everyone is speaking about, and that's Sasha again. Yeah, massive, massive call. Um, I thought that we would see it at some point this year. I don't think any too many people expect to see it now. Um, we know that Rusty Rasmus, and I think particularly Tony Brown, they rate this kid very, very highly. Yeah. Um, he's the only player that's played every single match this year. He played against Wales, played against Ireland, played against Portugal. Um, so he's playing his fifth match for the Springboks this year. Um, sure. And two months ago, he hadn't even debuted. He's uncapped. He's now starting yeah. a flower. And, and so, never mind in the conversation to be a part of 23s regularly. You know, yeah. It's yeah. like he, he was a point. It's like Wales, okay, cool. Give him his. He was, almost a, he was almost a surprise selection in, in the initial big squad. Everyone and then was, like, was retained. Hey, cool. Yeah. Get him in so that England can't poach him, not because we want to use him right here, right now as our X Factor player. Yeah, and, and I think I think the main thing as well, you know, is the injury to Dave Willemser. You talk about times, timing, and mm. suddenly he provi- he provided that sort of six two uh, versatile player off the bench, and then his performances since he's come on have and, and his performances in training have really impressed the coaching staff. And now they mm. said, well, hell, we, he has the keys, you know, no. ru- you know, run it, run it against Australia and see what happens. And mm. Mm. You know, I think I think I read something like like Andre Paul has played seventy one tests. I think this was only the seventeenth one he's playing off the bench. Crazy. You know, so one does not simply bench Andre Pollard. No. Um, and I think this is a really interesting dynamic because, first of all, we, these two things, we need to understand that he is a youngster. So, look, I'm predicting a really good game from him this weekend. But if he, if it isn't, we just remember that he is that he is that he is still progressing. But if he goes and has a great game this weekend, I finally feel we finally got a flower hop who's really going to push Andre Pollard and just remind him that, listen, you're not untouchable. Um and I'm not to say that Andre Pollard feels that he's untouchable, but he has been for the last, you know, six, seven years. Yeah. He's only never not been selected because of injury, you know. Yeah. Uh, and now you're kind of feeling that we, as we are, as we start to extend our depth, we might have people who might 
push him and sit there and and say that if you're going to be all, all form, we've got a genuine option yeah. available. Yeah, and, and I think that comes with Sasha's boot, right? Because I mean, Hundre still has the keys, it, it, and there, yeah. it will be his for as long as he really wants it to be. If we're being honest, for at least for the yeah. next three and probably next World Cup cycle, but you had the challenger. In money Leibok, and it was a completely new 10 that a spring that a yeah. spring hadn't had and, and money Leibok had to do so much to actually earn the right for south african 10 to play the way he did and he went yeah. to the world cup and jammed we all know his kicking woes have led to him falling out of favor in a sense that the the, the trust isn't there for him to be the only kicker on the field at the time sasha yeah. does have that ability and contains the creativity that money also has whether he's a better 10 is another question we've barely mm. seen Sasha at 10 at the storm yeah at this we, level yeah so at this level we, he's really going to be an anomaly he's mostly played 12 and 15 so he played 10 coming through the ranks SA schools for example so he's, he's going to be comfortable there but it's different type of pressure at this level and it's not a yeah. friendly versus Wales this is the um, you know, this is the rugby championship, and this bond cap isn't just going there to not win. We need to bloody no. win this rugby championship. Otherwise, this year is going to be, I think, considered a failure. You know, not yeah, winning the island series, not getting a rugby championship. It's like kill you can go win a couple games up in north in November, but that doesn't define your year. This defines your year. So to be given the the rain on the first game at 10, ballsy call. I think that's what also why they've put Hundre. As backup, similar to kind of the World Cup, if things are going a bit south, listen, come off. We'll re we'll look back at the drawing board and see what, what's gone wrong. Andre, you know, do your thing. Yeah, and I think also importantly, club is running like at nine, for example. Um, Damien Delendi at twelve, you've really at fifteen. You're surrounded you've by got, experience. <laughs> by experience, yeah. I mean, the the, the the least experienced player in the back line is currently Lawrence and then Kubus Rana from a cat's perspective. Like Kubus Rana is 35 years old, you know, 34 years old. Yeah. So he's uh, been around the block. He's played like three, 400 um, professional games. So yeah, it couldn't it couldn't have been said better for, for a solid yeah. game from, from Sash Fahm and Zulu. Um, let's talk a little bit about the bench, I think, Dan, because it is a 6-2 split, but no lock on the bench, which is a big call. Uh, so the bench is Malcolm Marks, Harris Camp, Vincent Koch, um, which was kind of um, expected. We weren't sure Malcolm Marks would be fully fit, but he's been cleared to go. Then mm. it goes Ben Jason Dixon, Marco Finstad, Quaker Smith, Grant Williams, Andre Pollard. Mm. No lock on the bench. Probably the first time ever we've had a 6-2 split with no genuine lock. And, and probably the first time in a long time we've ever had a non- and I, and I say non-genuine because Ben J. S. Dixon plays on the flank, a majority on, on the flank uh, mm, this, yeah. this season. He has played a lot previously for the Stormers, but um, needs must type of situation, not not yeah. uh, his, his go-to position. So it's, it's an interesting. He's going to only slot in there if there's injury, right? Like, yeah. it's going to be Sia and it's going to be Ulrich Lowe that likely come off for then um, Ben Jason Dixon. Mark of all, I guess if Peter Peter Steph could maybe shift to lock actually. Well, I think that, that well that's the whole thing. That's what Russia said. So because you've got Peter Steph the toy, he covers the five lock, for example. Ben yeah. Jason Dixon, uh, or Arkansas can cover four and five. Ben Jason mm -hmm. Dixon can go to five, potentially yeah. four, and, and a, a Peter Steph toy can go back to five. Almost go full okay. circle. It's interesting. A lot of people have been speaking about the fact that they wonder if we might see Peter Steph the toy go to five more in terms of prolonging his career, in terms of not having to be as as mobile. Um, mm. And although you are you watching him running down the wings during yeah, the yeah, I was gonna say with the with the new system think, we're playing, it doesn't look like he's slowing yeah, down and hanging no, around no, the ruts. No, not not at all. But it is an interesting con con idea. The fact that if he is striding on the flank, he could make the transition back to the tight five. Um, and uh, you know, play a bit longer, maybe there, especially given the fact that we have got a bit of a lock crisis. In no Franco Mostert, no Lua Diaga, no Jean Klein. Um, you know, we are missing a lot of our, of our players there. Um, but it's an interesting one in terms of, I mean, the three big breakdown threats and Malcolm Marks, Mark for starting Quaker Smith, uh, Quaker Smith back to the bench, you know, arguably the best impact player in the world last year, the way that he used to come on and, and affect games. So kind of going back to that, um, that sort of tried and tested formula. Mm. Um, and then Dan Grant Williams, somebody who I think a lot of people wanted to start. I can understand, and but I always keep saying Grant Williams has traditionally never really started. He started one game for the box, he lasted two minutes. We will kind of know what happened there, yeah, if, yeah, if, if that. But we've always kind of gone to Kubis Ryan as our starter when five the clerk's not playing. Um, I think Grant Williams is a phenomenal player, I think he's been playing brilliant rugby, but I think in this situation. 
I think it's the right decision not to try and start Grant next to Sasha, for example. Um, instead, you could have a Grant coming on later next to Andre Pollard. Um, yeah, that, that, that think... 910 combo is so crucial that you yeah. don't, although you have, you can have ex- arguably the most important link in the in the in a whole team, and to throw. Well, Grant Williams, you know, he's got a bit of experience now, but not with starting as much. And then even yeah. the pick of Mona van der Berg, like you're throwing two things that are, that are very, um, you know, unknown on the international stage at this stage um, in together. And you just don't know how that's going to work out. So you'd rather just go with the tried and tested World Cup, double World Cup winning Corbus Reiner and then be able to, you know, then pair your more inexperienced Grant Williams with Pollard. Yeah, I think so. I, I think I, I overall I agree with the squad collection. I think it's very exciting. I don't think there's too many issues we can we can find with them. It's a great pack, two really good front rows. It's got the impact. It's got pace. Um, there are lots of injuries in that uh, that Aussie camp as well. So we'll talk about predictions when we get there. But I, I think we've probably got enough uh, to to get over the line. Um, yeah, the question for me, Dan, is is you know, New Zealand's traditionally, and apparently even some people are, are, are polling them as favourites for the rugby championship, which is a wild shot. Um, let's talk about the rugby championship and New Zealand versus Argentina and Australia. How do we see this all going? You know, we don't really know what to expect from Australia. We've seen po- very positive signs under Joe Schmidt, but very mm. early days. Argentina, as you mentioned, a shaky home series against uh, against France. They are under new uh, coaching as well in uh, Felipe Contepone taking over. Mm. I mean, New Zealand beat England, but I think England messed up a massive opportunity for them to to have actually gone and gotten the job done um, against New Zealand, especially in that first yeah. test. So yeah. how, how do you see the whole rugby championship going? I think we'll figure out where teams are now. As we mm. mentioned in previous podcasts, we've only se- we've seen the North, Northern Hemisphere play each other, so we kind of know how they are. And we, we, we saw glimpses of the Six Nations of a very good England side who beat a very good Ireland side at home. Yeah. Then we saw now like the north south, you know, they saw we saw us play Ireland, drawn series, you know, France versus Argentina, France B team. It was a drawn series in the end, but kind of licking your wounds still a little bit if you're Argentina. Mm. And then and then New Zealand, a brand new New Zealand taking on England, getting through, but leaving holes and cracks in the door that could have been easily exposed and exploited by the English had they been a bit more clinical. So it could be a completely different conversation. That in of itself might be papering over gaps that the New Zealanders have made, although now at least they will have the confidence of maybe knowing that they haven't played that well but still getting over the line, which is what has had become so synonymous with every New Zealand team we've seen over so many years. You, it's the classic, you know, 60 minutes up, they're looking nowhere and they just mm-hmm. get it done. I think Australia, they, I mean, if you talk about a team that's really we're at the bottom of, you know, where they could have ever been after that World Cup, that's exactly where they were. Joe Schmidt managing to get three out of three results, albeit against, you know, bad Wales team and Georgia, mm-hmm. who were positive, but not enough of a threat. I think they've yeah. been able to just just stop the boat from rocking a little bit and give a couple of their players just start and almost enjoying their rugby. So now it's going to be like, okay, you've had, you know, uh, two re- relatively undercooked teams that you've played against. How about yeah. world champions? Correct. Correct. No, I agree. I think it's, as it for us, it's ours to lose. Um, and I think the, the point you make, we're going to find out where they are now. That that I think is that exactly. You know, we've got an incoming series, outgoing series, are very interesting ones because you're playing against teams that might rotate. For example, in the case of Argentina versus France, a Wales side going through a whole transition. So mm. I think that Wales side will be competitive in a couple of years, but yeah. we all know they're not quite where they are. So, you know, the best sort of only two. I think opponents who were settled were England and Ireland, and we saw how close those sort of series were. Um, mm-hmm. But Dan, let's talk a little bit about the, the about, about the rugby championship because Sanzar has introduced four law variations. Now let's go through. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to kind of brush through the two which aren't creating too much of a, of, a, of a hype. We'll talk a little bit about the one a bit more. But first of all, let's talk about if a ball is not straight in a lineout, um, but the other team doesn't contest, play on. Yay, nay from you. I can see there be they're going to be loopholes soon. We don't know yeah. what they are yet, 
but something's going to happen and be like, okay, no, we're going to have to make that rule back. So I, within yeah. a year, that rule is going to be gone. I think they'll have, probably have to try and talk about, you know, within a within reason, a margin sort of thing, like a, you know, a half a meter or whatever, you know, it, you can't just sort of throw it from here to the fly half, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that there'll, there'll need to be a, um, It'll be fun, though. People get creative in the first year, for sure. Yeah, but that's the thing. So it'll be interesting to see how people interpret that. I think on the base, I don't really mind it. I think if you don't contest, I think you forfeit the right to to have the turnover. You know, if it's slightly skewed and you didn't contest, then I think it's well, then contest next time. You know, that's the, whole, the reason that the, the ball has to be thrown in straight is so that when you contest, you have a, a chance of getting it, a reasonable chance. So if you're going to, um, if you're not going to contest, for example, I don't don't mind the fact that you forfeited the chance of, of the turnover. I think the big thing is obviously within reason. You know, no one's no one's going to have an issue if you know the number two jumper goes shared the front of the lineup. It's slightly skewy, comes down, and we play on. The issue, mm -hmm. as I said, comes when it starts becoming a bit extreme and they start finding um, yeah. those loopholes. But that's the least controversial of all the laws. Uh, the next one is protection of the number nine. Uh, you cannot be within a meter at the rack, similarly at the mall. But the big ones for the scrum, where the opposite number nine can now go only go as far as the middle of the tunnel. So they basically have to be behind, in line with their props or the you know, the heads of their props, yeah, or else they, they have to retreat thing. to the eighth man, or else that they retreat the full five minutes and join the the defensive line. Um, so an interesting variation that this might promote, for example, people are saying that now allows the um, the, the the team with a put in to go to the boot, for example, off the back of a scrum. Mm -hmm. You know, you're traditionally never going to boss kick off the back of a scrum because the scrum is right on you. Well, well now I'm they're not. From eight as well. So, yeah, so exactly. And I think for me, the reason I don't like this rule is we're talking about depowering the scrum. We'll talk a bit more about that. This, for me, you know, it takes away that 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 the difficulty of a scrum of having to get the ball out of the scrum when under pressure. You know, when you've got that that scrum off bearing down you, that ball that you're having to go dig for, you know, the scrum off's there waiting to try and do it. The, the eighth man doesn't know if he can pick it up or not. You know, you've now got that clean opportunity as an eighth man can clean pick up, for example, and go, you're not going to have number eight on you. The number nine's not going to have to contend with the, with the opposite number nine. So I think that for me as well, I don't, I'm not a massive fan. Um, I don't think the scrum offs need much protection. At, I, I think it's one of those laws where was it really necessary? Um, yeah, I don't watch Rabia really, and think... Really been a, 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 you know, the reason for it, the scrums get penalized when they're going too early and they're, yeah. you know, they're trying to jackal the ball. It just kind of removes that extra layer that scrum offs always have that is just pissing off everyone else, you know, being in places you feel like they shouldn't be in. Yeah, yeah which is for I mean, me, like half the fun about a scrum off. Yeah, exactly. It, it brings yeah. about that, that fuff to clack personality of I'm going to just get in the way, you know, I'm going to shoot up, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the person that's in your ear, breathing down your yeah. neck. I mean, Again, these these rules, they're always hard to predict how they're going to go. But yeah. when you see how different teams think creatively, to, okay, is this an advantage on, or disadvantage on offense or defense? But I think large, largely it'll be exposed uh, with a couple of games played. Yeah, right. Then the next big one is... Uh... The free kick one, uh, the, the shot clock, the shot, the shot clock, which is now going to be brought in 60 seconds for penalties and conversions. I don't think anybody's had an issue with that. It's the 30 second shot clock for lineouts now, as well as for scrums. Now, the issue comes not so much with the shot clock, but the result of that is then a free kick to the opposition or to whoever had it. Um, if you are uh, delay and you're not ready to scrum or have a line in 30 seconds, um, and because of the new and laws, defined, so is, let, 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 let's just make this clear. By ready, it's people at the location. For example, jumpers ready to jump, ball in ready hand. To go, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, and for scrums, down there, ready um, to set, basically. Yeah. Yeah, not not just at the mark and kind of, no, you need to be ready to go. The, the, the referee can call, crouch, you know, yeah. bind, set, you know. Um, the, 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 if you do not do that, then it's a free kick. Now, the big, obviously, change recently with the free kick is that the, the removal of the scrum as an option. So the issue comes from a manipulation point of view. You, for example, are getting absolutely dominated in the scrums. You could be have a, a defensive scrum, and you you take longer than thirty seconds. They then you can Rather see the pin, a free kick, the free kick, yeah, and then they get a a tap and go, or else they have to kick the ball to you. You know, yeah. similarly with a lineout. If if you know you're it's five minutes, time out, wasting now, yeah, very very easily. Like what, what I, I don't want to concede a scrum underneath the scrum the penalty. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Which they, where they can take a three-pointer. So I'll just concede a free kick by not having the scrum, and then they either kick it away or they have to tap and go. Similarly with the lineup, I, you know, I don't want to concede a five-meter uh, mall 
because we've been dominated. So therefore, I'll just take a while to get to the line out, concede a free kick. We've got our entire defensive line set up, or uh, 15 players, and and we'll defend. You know, you're not going to go and take. Um, you're not going to win a line out, uh, and you're not yeah. going to win a penalty and go for another line out. You're not going to suddenly take a scrum on the five meter line where you can potentially scrum us or win the penalties. So, not a fan of that because I think it's far too easy to be manipulated. For me, I think it's also it's hilarious because there's been so much said to, as you said, devalue the scrum and how much outcry there's been with South Africa's 6 2 split, 7 1 split. By speeding this game up, you're going to need those subs sooner. So more and more teams are going to have to rely because props, they are big humans and the forwards are big yeah. humans. They can't get around the park very quickly. You're putting time pressures on these mammoth humans instead of, you know, giving them, I, I mean, I don't think, I feel like the argument that the game with the ball in play more and then it makes for a better game is so false. And I feel like it's been disproven yeah. so, so many times over. That's and my biggest that, problem, isn't it? You know, what when are rugby fans are complaining about a lot? I don't see a lot of fans complaining about ball and play. The only Being time ball like, and play was mentioned was um at the World Cup last year when yeah, Fox yeah, tried to argue that their game versus Namibia was better than our game versus Ireland, and everyone said, Shut up, you're being a sore loser, you know. Yeah, correct. Because and and ball and play wasn't uh, actually that high for the for the South African Island series. No rugby fan has said that was a boring series. That is exactly. as good as it gets. It's it's these guys get busted and broken. It's not sevens, and I feel like again it, is, it wasn't an issue. And now it's being forced. I, I think more people are going to have six two split benches, and then everyone's going to look at South Africa and can't be irritated. So if anything, maybe it works in our favor. Yeah, from that perspective, I think was, but maybe yeah. not the conceding of the, 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 the free yeah, kick. Yeah, and the deep of the scrums. Because you can't choose yeah. a scrum from a free kick. That's obviously not going to Yeah. Happen. And then the final one is now there is a red card and then there's a red er card. <laughs> because there is now a red card, card. And if it's, you know, yeah, 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 a Roy Roy card. Blue uh, Roy. You know, uh, Literally, because there's now two different yellow co- red cards, and yet it's the same red card. Where a red card, or a full red card, is what they're saying, is if it is found to be deliberate and dangerous, stuff like that, that player will be removed from the field, and the team will not be able to replace them. If it is more on the sort of the accidental side, for example, or no foul play or no serious foul play has been committed, then it will be a 20 minute red card where the player will be removed for the entire match, but after 20 minutes, they'll be able to replace them. Once again, can we just leave the red card alone? In my opinion, can we just? It, it's why are we complicating this? And even with this, if you're going to do this, surely you introduce a, an orange card. How can we have a red card, a full red card, and then a a, a, a semi half? I mean, so what? Does the, does the ref fold in half when he does it? I mean, what's what's going on here? Yeah, it's, it's a bit confusing. I feel like the bunker was kind of getting figured out, and despite the I think reaction to like that Andre Esterhaz and recent one. From South Africans, I yeah. do think that mostly sense prevailed, and that was a red. So, by the letter of the law, Stevie, in that scenario, under Esther Hazen is then being replaced in twenty minutes. Correct. Um, I think so. Well, if, if they judge it to be accidental, for example, yeah. Um, and, and, but know. I think that so much of red cards come down to malition, which is where it's confusing. This, I feel like they're very few. Or, or it may, maybe it's actually not. Maybe it's it's because of the head contact. It, it, it used to yeah. be pure militia. Now now it's just head contact. So I think maybe that's what they're defending against, right? Is the Andre Esterhazy scenario when he's got it all sorts of wrong? He hasn't meant to do that, but he's lined him up and he hasn't gotten yeah. the right body position. And essentially, and- what they're saying is, okay, we'll give you twenty. When it's a rugby incident, we'll give you twenty minutes off, and yeah. then someone else come back on. But when you have spear tackled someone and put them on their head, off you go. No one can yeah. you. Which very rarely and, happens, actually. Yeah, well, I think that's the thing. And I think the main thing is that red cards are supposed to be a, 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 a cause to try and prevent you from doing things. And it's about behavioral changes. So it's not about chastising Andre Essay. I'm not, not saying that he went there and he had the intent of harming and he wants to go and absolutely decapitate the Portuguese player. The red card is to sit there saying, 
you cannot go upright into a tackle. You've got to get the tackle low. That's the whole point of this. You're supposed to be adjusting player behavior yeah. and adjusting in the game to make it safer, which is why, yes, it's a rugby incident, but it's a preventable rugby incident because if he goes lower, for example, and he makes a tackle below the chest, then that doesn't happen. Yeah, For me, um, I, mean, I don't mind it so much. I just think 20 minutes is too short if you're doing this. Make it 40 minutes. You know, if it happens in the second half, you're done. Then uh, if it happens in the first minute, like it did for Andres days, and you play a whole half without without that extra player, at least I think to to make teams feel, as you say, to make it the action preventative from happening again, then you need to have serious consequences. And I don't think 20 minutes does that. Well, my biggest sort of argument that it doesn't do that is just look at, you know, New Zealand uh, or Super Rugby you know, which we know has got the worst possible reputation when it comes to never handing out red cards or yellow cards when it comes to some seriously hectic foul play. And then they've got the red, and then they introduced a 20 minute red card and things got even progressively worse, you know, where, where there's just been very little you change. Behavior. The World Cup final because their captain got a red card. Yeah, correct. Correct. Um, so yeah, no wonder they're, they're, they're in favor of a 20 minute red card because then in that situation, Sham came probably would have been able to be replaced by 20 minutes. But speaking, so, so, so everywhere, those are the little variations. We can't speak too much about them. We've got so much to get through because speaking of captains, um, one CM Tanda Khaleesi is on his way back to South Africa. Um, <laughs> thanks to, uh, Fabrizio right. Erasmus. <laughs> I mean, it's comical. You don't see this thing ever, these, these things ever happen. Eh? And no. just press conference. Uh, Rassi, what's the story of the rumors of maybe Sia come back? Oh, yeah, no, he's coming back. His agent has been calling me the whole time trying to um, help facilitate the deal. Yeah, the Sharks are speaking to him and he'll, he'll be back soon. It's like, what? Yeah. This was a rumor, like an unfound, like, you know, no one had really had, you know, solid grounds up until this point to continue to speculate other than what was as yeah, literally yeah. just in the room wall. From that to, you know, head coach of the Springboks jumping in and, and exclusively saying like outright, yeah, no, it looks like yeah. it's happening. And and yeah. I've been I've been a part of this process. And so it looks like Sario are gonna have to pay a part of his, I don't know, is it a buyout clause? Dude, I, yeah, I mean, well, I, I think it's, I don't know if it's a buyout clause or buying him out of his contract type of thing. Because the problem is, Racing put up 17 million rand last year to buy him out of the Sharks contract. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so there is kind of the matter of, of that. Now, you probably find if Racing would probably take a similar amount of money and just say, basically, pay us back the money that we pay for you. We had a season, cool, yeah. call it quits, bug you off. You know, our owner evidently doesn't like you, thinks you're fat, whatever. Um, but they're certainly not going to just let him walk away for free. You know, you don't, you don't, you don't, it's not exactly a small amount of money that you just go, ah, what's 17 million rand, you know? For, um, for, for a caliber player like Sio Khaleesi as well, you also lose yeah. the player as much as he, the player and the marketability of the player, the profile of the player. I oh. mean, that's the big thing a lot of people talk about. You know, it's not, you're not just signing him as the player, the Sharks are getting a marketing dream. You know, you slap him every single poster far and wide. You yeah. know, you, it's, it's, so there's a massive part of that. Uh, just in terms of the actual move, I, don't mind the move um, as long as, personally for me, I don't think SRAB should be contributing anything towards the move itself. If they continue, I mean, obviously he's, uh, he's, a, he's a player of national interest, so they contribute towards a salary. Continue to do that by all means, uh, but I don't think they should be stumping up any of the cash to be buying him out of a racing contract because I think 70 million rand to go and spend money like that to bring Sierklisi back when our sevens has been defunded and or has been had the sevens funding has been cut back when yeah. you know our women's game is so in desperate need of funding. We talk about how much the Curry Cup is bleeding money because it doesn't have a spot. Well, now it's got a sponsor, but you have got all these things which you know and they talk about how little money we have to then go and contribute towards a massive transfer yeah. fee to bring back our thirty-four year old. Largely to make largely to make Sia happy. And listen, if there's anyone that we want to make happy at Sia Khaleesi, but yeah. if it does involve, as you say, spending 70 million rand, I'd rather he goes and, you know, just have one more year on that rising contract, whatever yeah. it is, go, go, go play out a little bit more time there because like that, that, that is a stupid amount of money for a player that, it's not like he's not allowed to play for the Springboks anymore. It's not like yeah, that. that, that, that not we, you know, we're, we're not bringing him back so that he can suddenly play for us. You know, it's yeah, not like, like nothing actually it's changes. Not, yeah, it's not New Zealand rugby going and buying out Richie Mwanga's Japanese contract to set, to bring him back so that he can play for the All Blacks and make him a whole different team. He's still playing for the box, you know. So yeah. from a box perspective, and you know, nothing changes, which is why I think from an SA rugby perspective, holistically, nothing's really changed by him going overseas. You yeah. know, for um, sure. 
So that's a big story. Another big story is um, the uh, Alliance, which uh, for those yeah. who don't know, is what uh, Twickenham is going to be called. Yeah. Um, massive reaction uh, towards this. People talking about the fact that how can you, you know, rename such an iconic stadium? No one's going to call it the Alliance anyway. And I think my reaction is always the same when it comes to these things. Who cares? Yes, you're not going to call it the Alliance. You're going to call it Twickenham. Great. But that is money in the bank. I don't understand why people are ever upset about naming rights for stadiums, you know, when, when there's clearly, you know, financial struggle. Um, it's, it's, it's the, the financial, you know, benefits are massive. And it's such an easy yeah. way to make easy money. Yeah. I think there's, you know, we all have the romantic side of us that, you know, appreciates and you're a Man United fan. I'm a Liverpool fan. I'm happy that my stadium isn't called the Barclays, whatever, yeah. or the, you know, Etty had this, that for yes. you know, like Old Trafford. I, I do, I like, you'd prefer it to, of course, but yes. when you look at the fundamentals of sport as a business and how it needs to be run in terms, we mentioned now investment in it and the, the yeah. dire couple of years that English rugby has been through, just the liquidation of a couple of clubs like at the of the top tier they clearly yeah. you know and then then their seven system system not even qualifying for the the men's olympics so the the issues and they needed money there and this has been in the works for actually a couple months now and it's it, it has come to an end i think everyone will continue calling it twickenham and that's absolutely yeah. fine it's just like the you know dhl stormers you know, you call it the DHL, DHL Stormers, Stadium, but I'm a Stormers you know, fan. I'm not a DHL Stormers fan. I'm, just, you know, it's yeah. fine. It's I really mean, it's Emirates, if it's Emirates Airline Park, we all know it's Ellis Park. You know, yeah. And, and it's always you know, yeah. going to be Soccer City. Yeah. You know, as much yeah. as it's the FNB Stadium. Correct. And I think, and I said, I said, you know, and you make a good point as being United and, and, and Liverpool fans. It's really nice from our perspective. But I can tell you right now, if 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 Manchester United was was on the verge of financial collapse, and this was like. Listen, guys, we can sell the stadium, uh, you know, name, and we can keep ourselves in the Premier League and keep ourselves going. Yeah, damn right. Make it the friggin' sportingbet.com 45 <laughs> stadium, you know. So if you if you don't have to do it in your position where you don't where you, where you don't have to do it, then then great. But the reality is a lot of teams do need and, and unions doing this kind of money. And um at the end of the day, if, if whatever pays the bills, pays the bills. Yeah, we're gonna see a, a manscaped Trafford soon. Yeah, correct. Yeah, I'm all for it. Right. I'm all for it. At the home. This, yeah, operate. Um, but let's move on here, Dan, because tomorrow the pro tiers get back onto the field. Very exciting. And uh, we'll, we'll go through a little bit about the, the performances we saw in their warm-up match against a West Indies Championship eleven. Um, but the main thing we're going to focus about is, is kind of about how the team's going to be compromised and um, what to look forward to in this test series. So... We played against the West Indies Championship eleven. Um, they scored 397. We bowled them out. Um, big hundreds there from Jeremy uh, Solizano and Shamar Springer for the West Indies Championship. Uh, the big performance with the ball for the South African was Dane Pete back in action, three for forty-one, and uh, Kiso Bar with three for forty-seven. In reply, South Africa were four hundred and eight for nine, and they declared um, lots and lots of runs across the board. Aidan Markham eighty-two before being retired out. Tony Dzorzi nine, Tristan Stubbs eight at three, where he is expected to bat tomorrow. Mm. Um, but apart from that, Tim Bavuma fifty-one of one hundred and forty-five retired out. David Bellingham seventy-four of one hundred and seven retired out. Ryan Rickleton eighty of one hundred twenty-one retired out. Carl Verain sixty-five. Of 103 retired out. Vian Mulder not out with 17 or 51. Keshav 11. Uh, Matthew Breska 5. And Nanjaberger not out, but then we declared. So Dzorzi, Stubbs, and Breska not getting runs. Everybody else in the runs was bodes well for uh, mm. uh, for the series. And then in reply, West Indies were 46 for 4 um, before the draw happened. Lungi Gidi getting 3 for 8. Big for Lungi. It'd be huge for me. So the question then is, is Dan, is that we've now got to pick a team. Now, the predicted team, um, well, I've put together, I've thrown together, I took a predicted team and I've changed what I think it's going to be. And I'm going to read it out and see if you have any changes and we'll talk about it a little bit. I've got Aiden Markham, Terry Dezorzi up top. Tristan Stubbs at three. This, by the way, this is not what I want to happen. This is what I'm predicting is going to happen. Okay. Um, Tristan Stubbs at three, Tim Bavuma at four. They're betting him at five. Carl Verain at six, Rick Keeper, Vian Mulder at seven, Keshe Maraj at eight, Dane Pete at nine, KJ Abada at 10, Nanjay Berger at 11. 
I just see, I mean, how thin is that batting lineup, Stevie? Gosh, it's, it's, it's like we're going against West Indies, in, in West Indies, which, and they have a decent bowling lineup, but they're not, they're not at the peak of their powers. They, they're also in a building phase. So I'm not too worried about this one, but geez, if I was going to Australia, I'd be, yeah. I'd be cucking myself because you can't, like, I just don't think Calvarena can be a six. That's far too early. He's a, he's a, holds the bat decently but at test level he's yet to be proven not with a you know an unbelievable technique to the eye not that always necessarily defines one's test career just look at dean elga but i think you're probably right i think this will be the team what i would probably prefer is a if you chuck in that extra batter you you mm -hmm. know of, of rickleton i feel a lot more solid but I understand why they'll go for this team because they want Vian Mulder to be there so desperately. And please, can this be the last opportunity, Stevie? I mean, I know you love the guy. Hey, 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 I know hey, you're hey, a lion hey, boy. Hey. 17 but... knots out. He's just come off like a yeah. good season for <laughs> exactly. the Lions. Oh, God. He's going to score 30 runs and take two wickets and a catch and be called player of the series. No, no, he's going to take the catch. The catch. Yeah, yeah. I mean, last time we were there, it was actually that was when Keshav got his hat trick and he took that blinder for on on hat trick ball. To be fair, so has he has he risen to those heights since? No, he hasn't. And he he's just he's the queen of dominating at the domestic level and then falling short at international. I would love nothing more than the South Africa to have a good all rounder, but he has not proven it to me and, and me, most other South Africans. Otherwise, bowling wise, KG Nandre. Yeah. Okay. So some people, so, so some people saying it's a bit of a toss between Lungi. I absolutely love. I tell you what. I'll, the problem is it's in the West Indies because I would almost like to have seen us almost go with one spinner, um, and um, I think we could, and then and, and go and go and then and then Lungi get Aiden, get Aiden. get get um Aiden to just throw in yeah. a couple of some off offies involved in there. Yeah, I think I think I mean we could replace um, Dame Pete with with uh, Lungi. You know, that, that, that's not out of the question, especially now that Lungi's taken a couple of wickets. But as you said, in West Indies, it is likely that we'll go with the two spinners. And, and Vien Mulder yeah. does help with the pace, bowling and overs. And the batting. And he, yeah. he, he's one of those. I mean, he doesn't help with the batting. That's just a lie. Hey, he helps, hey, hey. He helps 17 with the not overs. out. 17 he helps with not the out. Overs and he just, he doesn't tire. So, you know, he's a very fit oak and in, can kind of just probably bowl 20 overs maybe pick up a wicket or two, which is helpful when you're out there in the, in the heat. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. How, how would you change then from this predicted to 11 to what your ideal 11 would be? First of all, I would have Varane out and Rickleton in as, as keeper. Um, uh, I'm a big Carl Varane fan. Um, and I think he, and I think he's got a bit bright future. I do think he's been given a lot of opportunity to test level. He hasn't quite come right. And I think Ryan Rickleton's been playing stupidly good cricket for a while now. It is good that Ryan Rickleton still isn't in this test team. Yeah. In, so, in a, yeah, sorry, continue. Yeah, so I was saying, so that, that would be my change. It would be Carl for, for, for Ryan. Um, I personally don't like the order, I don't like Tristan Stubbs at three. I think he could be a terrific six, um, or even five. So, I personally would move everyone down the order. I think Timber can bat at three, or David Benning can bat at three. I think they're both they're both capable of doing that. Um, I mean, I know your, your, your premier batsman tends to bat at four. So if Temba wants four, Temba wants four. He's been our best and most consistent fine, test yeah. batsman in the last few years. He gets to decide. I think David Bettingham can do a job at, at three if if he needed to. Um, alternatively, you could um, swap around I mean, a couple of people. But I think... You, yeah, yeah. if you do go with Markham as a general bo genuine bowling option, you could drop... Vian Mulder and chuck Ryan Rickleton at three and move Stubbs down to six. Then you can, yeah, do that and then have and, and, and keep Varane as keeper. Um, exactly. Or you, or you keep Vian Mulder and you, and, well, or you, you probably drop Dan Pete because I think you probably still want a third. Can't team drop Vian Mulder. No, never. There's not no, well, are, you, are, you, are you gonna have you, you, you know, two, two, two seam options, no, two no. spinners? If you know, if, if, if there's an injury to a seamer, then you've got your seam attack or Vian Mulder no, for sure. But then <laughs> that's fine. Else. I don't mind Vian Mulder coming in at. At um, eight, I don't mind that. That's okay. Listen, then after this, after the series, then we're going to be coming at four. We're going to have our Jacques Cullen's replacement. He's going to bang two hundreds, and it's going to be problem solved. Yeah, well, we'll know a lot more by this time next week. So 
you know, it will be interesting. It's good, just great that Test Cricket's back. I'm super excited to be able to. I mean, it's going to be super early. I have to. Yeah. A couple no, of it's not too bad. I think, I, think, I think tomorrow starts at four o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, right. It's the afternoon. I read yeah, four. And it's, I read, it's, it's the other way I read, yeah. It's because, it's because when the World Cup was there, I, I remember the trauma of waking. Well, it wasn't trauma. It was a great day. Waking up at 2 a.m. for Afghanistan. Yeah, today. those, so those now, were the good ones, actually. Who would have thought that waking up early in the morning were actually the, the fun times? Yeah. It was that bloody four. It was that final that started at four o'clock, which was the issue. Yeah, no, but I, I, I've got my time zones all wrong there. Okay, so it's afternoon. Oh, that's delightful. That's, that's yeah, no, it's phenomenal. It's it's clock off work, settle in, and watch yeah. test cricket the entire evening. So to the wives and girlfriends, you think they're coming home after the day to spend time? No. You know, Olympics like... trade transition. Correct, correct. It's just, yeah. So it starts at 4 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Um, should be an absolute delightful test. Dan, we have still got Olympics into our last few days of the Olympics and then the Paralympics gets underway, which is actually where we thrive. We do a lot better in the Paralympics than we do in the mm. Olympics, uh, traditionally in terms of our medal count. But we have had a very interesting last week. Let's just go over a few of the results and then we'll sort of dive into a couple of the, the key stories because there's a lot to talk about. Mm. Um, within the last week, Tatiana Smith, first of all, adding to her medal count, coming agonizingly short from going double gold, get the silver though in the 200 best joke, her preferred event, but does become the most successful successful South African Olympian ever, two goals, two silvers, the undisputed GOAT as far as I'm concerned. Um, and then announced her retirement. So we'll talk about yeah. retirement in, in, in a little bit. Um, she, by the way, raced next to Katie Corbett in that final, which was good to see. Peter Kotzer, another uh, African record in, uh, in the 200 work. backstroke. Um, so Mr. Drip King is, uh, is, is, is still operating a big, big talent, um, for, for the next Olympics. Breaking um, we've also, that was, yeah, um, correct, the whole works. That, that, um, it's been the best, it's been the best part of this Olympics. Although the, the medal count hasn't been quite as high as we probably would have wanted. Um, a lot of these athletes are breaking PBs and you, yeah. whenever that's happened, you just can't ask anything more. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, that's this the thing, like, you know, Peter could be fifth, fifth place. P, African record, his best ever swim, for example. We'll speak about Akani, but the same thing, you know, his best ever run. And, yeah. you know, when you give of your literal best ever and you still come up short, then, you know, it's, oh, it's one fine. of those things. There are levels to the game. You know, it wasn't the case of you didn't choke in inverted commas, you didn't just not perform, you perform, but there were just somebody better, which exactly. happens. That's kind of exactly. the Olympics. But I think generally it's been a little bit disappointing in the pool. I would have liked to grab another medal there. I think Peter Kutz are coming so short twice was 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 agonizing especially when you watch the 200 meter backstroke and he was probably the fastest you can't you talk about straight line speed in formula one he was the fastest i reckon you know during the lap but his underwaters and turns were what let him down similarly actually with tatiana, she, every, tatiana. every single time she, she yeah. turned she had to make up that ground so yeah. interestingly enough that that similar things happening to both those those athletes hopefully that's something that's 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 quite fixable mm -hmm. um but uh let's just talk about tatiana before we go to something else the what's the more to say the the queen of swimming for staff uh, and just what a story after all the issues she had uh trying to cope with the pressure and stuff to rise up and deliver another gold and a silver and then to say right i'm done i'm calling it quits like mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. i've done what i needed to do I've, I've proved to myself that i can do it that's my legacy for sure and there's something that's so special about the olympics is that people become an overnight success which is exactly what she became for yeah. large parts of um the followers of the olympics she no one knew, really knew who she was before tokyo and then she went gold silver with a world record and all of a sudden she's the golden child of south africa you know she's everyone's demanding a side of her she mentioned how she yeah. really struggled with that didn't really want to get back into the pool as many swimmers go through including the likes of michael phelps coming back getting the gold in where she where she plays silver and then silver where she plays yeah. gold and honestly just hanging her head up high she couldn't mm. have been proud of herself which is actually what you really want to see and it would have been tough of course she wanted to get that last gold to to sign off and actually her preferred event but you can understand like to, for, for them to for her to have the level headedness just to say i'm happy yeah. this is my career it's done now uh, i can you know i think she i mean had she come last in that race i think she would have been fine she had made peace so uh, she is she, yeah. and the best olympian of all time equal medals um with chad, Klo, with chad. But, 
more more goals, two goals for Tatiana. Oh, I was busy for... like load shedding over here, demand. <laughs> yeah, I see that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, some also some good results, decent results across the board as well. Although no more medals after that mm. one from Tatiana. The golf we had uh, Bezed and Hoot coming 16th with a negative uh, a score of nine under, and then Van Royen mm. coming 17th just after him with a score of eight under. We have, in the 400 meters, we have um, Sakichi Nene and Leif Pile, who both in the, and I always butcher this name, the Repejage. Repejage? Repejage. Repejage. You'll get there eventually. Repejage. Okay, I think I had it. Repejage race <laughs> after not yeah. actually qualifying in the heats. Um, Nene with the time of 44.81 and Pile with time of 45 40 and they will be competing is that tomorrow stevie was that uh, the 400 is tonight tonight so this will yeah. be we'll be we'll know if they're in the final by the time you listen to this moving on yeah. to the 100 meter final stevie and wow 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 what a race uh-huh. akani simbine missing out on mm. that medal he so craved by zero comma zero one seconds, one hundredth of a second, and just missing out to in first Noah Lyles with the nine seven nine, um, Thompson with an also a nine seven nine coming yeah. second by five thousandths of a second, and then Fred Curley in a nine eight one, Zimbabwe four, Jacobs five, um, Tabojo six, Bednarik seven, and Seville eight and uh, just a record-breaking 100 meters everyone and the first time ever everyone's been under mm-hmm. 10 seconds so as much as it wasn't well, the fastest race ever yeah. you could argue there's still the best race ever yeah i think also i think we knew we were in for a special race when benjamin richardson became the first person ever to run 9.95 in the semi and not qualify for the final yeah so I was it was as well yeah i mean absolutely heartbreaking especially when you watched it yesterday and you know came up short in the 200 with his hamstring and his, and his out of the olympics so mm. you know it was it was it was one of the most competitive finals we've seen in a long time and uh is is now we are talking about a new generation of sprinters. You know, your long gone are your Justin Gatlins, your, your Tyson Gays, the you know Asafa Powell's, Usain Bolt generation. That was what we grew like up Akani watching. Is probably the last of that generation, actually. Yeah, Akani. Mm-hmm. I mean, Andre de Grasse, for example, is still still going, but yeah. didn't make to the final. Yeah. You know, those those are the OGs. You know, yeah, the, the um, name that just needs to roll off the tongue. Uh, yeah, yeah but, but I think can I, can I just talk about two? Like, can we talk about how long it took for them to show who came through. Yeah, true. Actually, but I mean, I was, the whole way, it's just even for first was was agonizing. First, and then they, they confirmed it, and then like all they were just it was all on uh, Noah Lars. He's celebrating. I think it was like two minutes later, they eventually confirmed. Oh yeah, and by the way, Fred Curley got the third. He got yes. the entire South African yeah. at the oh, wait as he as he out dipped him, and eventually got the confirmation. Yeah. Oh. Um, it, it was it was truly it was heartbreaking, and and he spoke he spoke really well afterwards. He mentioned how. He was really gutted not to get the medal, but he knows how that he is so happy that South Africans are now being able to see a South yeah. African and a trailblazer in the 100 meter finals. He, and they should expect he, that. he has changed the game, he is our goat sprinter. I don't yeah. care what I'll never win a medal, we will win a medal in the sprint. Ah, Benjamin and, Richardson and he will be a part of that reason, yeah. that will be partially yeah. his, his, his medal because he has been the one to put us on the map. I mean, the amount yeah. of knowledge that he must be sharing with the, the likes of Shanguani and um, Richardson, yeah. it's just just ridiculous. I mean, he's been in three Olympic finals. He's won a Commonwealth gold. He's been in World Championship finals. He's shared, you know, he's he's ra- he raced against Bolt. You know, he raced, he, he's been in some of the fastest races ever. Yeah. And uh, in a different time, he could run the career he's had and walk away with three Olympic medals. Yeah. You know, exactly. um, but he for me is yeah, what he's done for for South African sprinting. And I just hope that you know our four by one hundred can get to the final so that he can go out running a featured race on Saturday mm-hmm. at Stade de France, you know, because that's what he deserves. Yeah. I don't yeah. I, I think our medal chances, which were 
Decent. Optimistic, but 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 you know, sort of. You know, I think we're probably looking at our sort of fourth, fifth, maybe a, a, a world class relay. If something happens, we get a third. We can grab a bronze, maybe a, a silver, to try and compete with Jamaica and and the States. Yeah, it's so so difficult. Um, and then after that, it becomes a bit easier because you've got select sprinters. You got a, one or two from like a, a Botswana and stuff. But after yeah. that, you know, especially with the the Caribbean nations, far more spread out. Um, but. Yeah, with Richardson no longer being part of it, you know, him, him being the second fastest African, uh, it's now a big, big call on to the 18, uh, the, the youngsters who are going to have to kind of step, step yeah. up. But I just, he just, he deserves to be in that stadium on Saturday running a four by 100 and going out, uh, you know, sure. competing oh. to, right to the end. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and as mentioned previously, getting an African record, breaking his own PB to finish with a 982. Again, you can't ask for more. It's it's no. just it's a game of margins, and he wasn't able to do it. Shout out No Lyles. Most people did not want him to win, and he was coming stone last for the first 40 meters. The yeah. fact that he pulled that off was out of this world. I thought, I thought not. I think, I think, I think, I mean, uh, Shane Thompson Thomas, apparently, I think, what's it? Led, led, led for um, 99 meters. Or like, some people say 99.9 meters. Yeah, well, it exactly was. Uh, it's probably a, a, a width of a hair. But, yeah, yeah. And look, to be fair to Noah Lars, I mean, he's, it's an interesting character. Just very quickly before we move on, is that he he attracts the attention. He's a big personality. He, he craves it. He craves mm. it, and it was always so over the top. And I, it was almost like that adrenaline kind of just was what the you know what got him in the end there. You know, very dramatic sort of pre thing, uh, pre sort of race routine and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, he sprinted um, the whole track before it began. Yeah. But um, yeah, credit to him because he, he he put a target on his back by saying, "I'm coming for the hundred meter. I'm going to be the fastest man." He still he believes he can break the two hundred meter record. Yeah, he, he's already uh, said so, he's going to whip everyone's ass in the in the two hundred meter. He said it in, in the yeah. press conference after the one hundred. So winners win, and he managed to do that. He Correct. talk shit if you back it up. Simple as that. Yeah, and and he did exactly that. Bang so, your body, chat you and get banged. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but on to the 200, which was yesterday. And as you mentioned, the big news was the unfortunate hamstring, what looked like a hamstring tear by Benjamin Richardson. He finished the race, in fact, which is very valiant because many would just step to the side. But he is now out for the rest of the Olympics. And that'll be a, a tough road to recovery for him. And, you know, really, be, mostly because I think mentally feeling like he's done so well and still not making yeah. that final. You can feel a little bit hard done by if you're him. And then, you know, looking set to qualify for the semifinals, you know, he still has the whole 200 meters to go. And in the 4 by 100 really his games was just getting going. And with his form, he could have, you know, gone on to really do anything. And that was him announcing yeah. himself to the world. And it's, it's a pity that's been cut short. So, unfortunately, he's out for not only the 200, but the rest of the Olympics. But um, big moves from um, more... Uh, from Sean Mashangari and Wade Funny Kak, who both qualified for the semifinals. Wade with a 246 and Sean with a 220 or 2020, sorry, 2046 and 2020. Um, yeah. so both going through and fair play to Wade. He was pulled in and told he was gonna um you know replace McCullough Adams. Big story. And if he had gone out and hit one, I think it would have been a, a lot of mm. um attack against the selectors. But he's backed it up, he's gone to the semi. I mean. The final might be a stretch, but as you mentioned previously, he might be called upon in that four by one hundred. Yeah, I hope so. Um, I think, from what I understand, that the injury now he's run under ten to... before. He's run under ten before. He is. He has. I think I actually looked at it earlier. He is. I think our fifth fastest under hundred ever. Um, he was the first man to run. Um, I think he was the first one to run sub 10, 100, sub 20, yeah. 200, and sub 44, um, 400. And then yeah. came so close to that sub only, 43. Yeah. The only so, issue is the lack of prep, right? He was going to run the 400 up until two weeks before the Olympics. So his body yeah. is not sprint, And he was always going to run the 200 as well. Yeah, well, it's, it's, an, it's, it's an interesting one, good. you know. I'd love to know, you know, did he decide to pull out the 400 because he just decided, but, you know, he just wasn't going to be competitive for the 400 and he felt he could be more competitive than the 200. I'm going to get the feeling that that was kind of maybe where he felt. He was like, listen, I just don't have it in me for the 400, but I reckon give the 200 a go. Um, but then so we'll, we'll, the relays. Yes. So there is a heat okay. on Thursday. Okay. I was guess in. Okay. That's going to be, that's going to be tough. So just heat straight to final then. No sense. Heat final. Yeah. Okay. 
Or at least that's just two more races then for him. It's not it's not possible. Yeah, assuming more. if he does get roped in, by the way, that's not confirmed yeah, just yet. Confirmed. So we'll, we'll wait and see. But Dan, let, let's just go through some of the other stuff. Uh, we are um, we have cut a lot and uh, got a lot to get through very quickly. Um, but uh, Prudence Seco Diesel um, came a bit short. We mentioned her a bit earlier. Very nice run from her. Yeah. Um, she will be back, which is the main thing. Only um, so years old. She's got so yeah, much. Exciting time. So Prudence, and uh, if you're watching this, shout out to you. Um, looks like she's really also enjoyed her time in Paris, which is good to see. People mustn't just go there and become a bit of a hermit and wait for their race. Go out, live it, experience it, mm. understand what it means to be an Olympian. Go to 2027 and go forth and, and charge for um, a medal. Um, as mentioned, we've got uh, our 400-meter runners um, in tonight. Um, but the rest of the, the week looks something a bit like this. Andrew Birkin and Hamish Lovemore into the Canoe Sprint semifinals. Um, so we'll wait to see what happens there. Zanae Heldenhase and Miguel Joseph into the 400-meter hurdle semifinal. And Miranda Sia breaks her personal best um, with a 50.66 um, in the 400. So that's kind of boding quite well for our mixed for for our 400 mm. um, relay. Mm. Which yeah, not sure what the, we'll have to wait and see what the chances are with them. But they're not um, they're in with a shot, I think. If they if they all were and and they're all starting to peak nicely. You know, Nene and uh, Life Pia both came back and getting into their semifinals. Yeah, uh, hopefully bodes well. Um, we've got golf. We've got uh, Paula Retu and Ashley Bua tomorrow. Watch out for Ashley Bua. She is a major winner. She's won the British Open, uh, the Women's Open. Uh, she's currently ranked 56th in the world. Um, we've got uh, women's kayak singles, 50, uh, 500 meter sprint tomorrow. Esti Olafia and Tiffany Koch. We've got Mal Jens van Rensburg in the uh, men's boulder and lead, lead semi final for sports climbing. Uh, tomorrow, we've got Brian Rotz in the high jump, which is very cool to see a, a South African high jumper. Yeah, high jump. Not really a medal contender. He's got the worst PB in the field. Um, his PB is 226. Qual- automatic qualification to the final is 229. Uh, but whilst they take the top, um 12 i think it yeah, is yeah. so you know he either needs to jump three centimeters up about i uh, um, better than his, his pb or else he's come in the top 12 he's only 20 years old so again one for the future good to see somebody like him yeah, going over there big learning curve. um yeah then we've got uh diving julia vincent's tomorrow um so that's some of the other stuff but then the big one that we want to chat about a little bit before we go into our um, so our prediction stuff is curtis stain runs on saturday in the marathon as mentioned dan will be there uh she's not probably even in anyone's favorites or in anyone's radar for a medal because first of all she doesn't compete regularly on the marathon circuit she is an ultra runner um i mean uh, world ranking i think she's like 56th or whatever because she i mean the last time she ran a competitive marathon was last year yeah. um she just this is not a distance she doesn't run it she however did come i think it was 15th in um in tokyo so not massively far behind and i'll tell you there's one thing we've learned over the last few years is you do not counter out of anything no headstrong headstrong i mean she, her whole career started only in her 20s and now she's in her early 30s now and she's one of the world's best so has been adaptable obviously used to the longer races many criticizing her for even running the comrades this year just because of yeah. the training required to actually compete at the highest level at the marathon distance but yeah she's got a, a pb of 224 the world records at 211 which was set last year um by um a sefa from ethiopia but the course record at least for the normal paris marathon is at 219 so probably going to play a little bit slower I think, you know, if she's sitting between 10 and 20, I think that's really solid for her. I would love yeah. a top 10. That would be unbelievable. Um, but, you know, in, in, in around that 230 mark, which is, you know, let's just sit back and also realize how bloody quick that is. It's, it's yeah, ludicrous no, it's these, these, what these marathon runners do, all of these runners, but uh, the, the endurance sports um, particularly. So, Gerda, I'll see you out on the side with my South African flag and Beret. Look out for me. I'll be cheering you on. Maybe even giving you a little push just ahead from a top 10 finish into a, 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 a well, outside the top 10 into the top 10. Yeah, no, I think I, I back her. Um, so then, Dave, we had a couple of things you want to speak about. I think we have got a bit over time, so we'll, we'll maybe address a couple of other things. So the last thing we want to speak about is probably the, the story of the Olympics, and that is this very dirty river. <laughs> Yeah. Um yeah. in the River Seine, yeah. which by the way, I was just watching the 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 the, the mixed relay yesterday for the triathlon. But a week ago we spoke about the triathlon, Jamie and Jamie Riddle and uh Henry Schumann in particular, both those two putting in very good performances in the men's triathlon. Um 
And yeah. uh, a week later, now all of a sudden, people are getting sick. Yeah. And uh, one, uh, one about... commented the guy that everyone, the viral clip of him chundering as he crosses the line, just spewing everywhere. He said he vomited between 10 and 15 times since and actually had to go to hospital. And that has now been followed by a bunch of other people having to go to hospital. And he said, yeah, he just took in a lot more water than usual. And no surprises. There is E. coli in the water. And yeah, it's it, it can't come as a surprise. And it's just a shame that they... It just seems it was so audacious which you like but you have to back it up if you're doing something like this you can't yeah. put in olympic athletes you know so, some of these people also might have more than one event and now they you know yeah. are not, are not sick not not able to compete so it, it's just a, it's just ridiculous that it got to this point and it is very very unfortunate i think the main thing is we kind of went what well, we knew this was going to happen yeah from the from the first postponement of the men's triathlon this was not a if it was an inevitability yeah. Um, and I mean, some people are calling this uh, not the first incident that's, that Paris have had. It's an interesting Olympics because a lot of people haven't liked it because a lot of things have happened, weird things. Um, we've had the boxing controversy, which we want to speak about. We'll speak about that yeah. next week uh, and stuff like that. But, you know, it's it's an interesting Olympics because it has been so phenomenally picturesque that the photos and the moments have been so phenomenal. But there actually have been a lot of controversy in these Olympics. So I think maybe next week we'll have to do a, a sort of a wrap up of the five oh. weirdest stories of uh of Paris 2024 because there have been some bizarre moments. Um, yeah, yeah, no, for sure, Stevie. I think let's let's just while while we've got, I think this is the, the very topical uh, right now in the boxing. So let's quickly cover it because we don't want to be uh, skirting around. I think we'll know the results of the boxing after this week, but obviously it's the big controversy of. DSD, Difference in Sexual Development Athletes, uh, Lin Yu Ting from Taiwan and Iman Khalif from Algeria competing in the boxing. Iman Khalif's opponent from Italy pulled out after 20 seconds and uh, resigned from her match. Why it's controversial is because now everyone, not everyone, but a large portion of the world have jumped at it and said, how can you allow transgender women pre with that being previously biologically uh, male sex and now changing to women um, to compete in the women's category. This is unequivocally false, like completely yeah. and utterly not true. So to give a bit of backstory of why this is and has caused a lot of confusion is because the IBA, the International Boxing Association, banned both these two athletes last year during a competition this was really the first time that either of them had actually made it um, past. They, they were, I believe, both at the Tokyo Olympics and lost. And and by any means have never known that they were, um, you know, DSD or, or anything other than female, which was their given um, gender and sex at birth and have a, a cho chosen to continue to, you know, assign that um, gender to themselves. So... That was news to them last year when the IBA pulled them out and suppose and then banned them from competing. However, it's come out in meeting notes that there, there were supposedly tests run and the, the, there was it was stated by them that there were um, higher testosterone levels than than were allowed for, for the IBA. The IBA um, sits so it's a different uh, committee to the Olympics. So this boxing was led by the Olympic Boxing Committee, so it is separate. However, the IBA has actually never come out with the tests. They've actually never been able to show what those test results did um, actually say. So there's no real proof for them to actually ban these women. And so the Olympic Committee, following their own guidelines, are if you have... You, you're born a woman, you identify as a woman, you haven't had any sex change, awesome, compete in the women's category. And mm. my big frustration, Stevie, is just the assumptions. We have seen it in Custis Semenya's example, and it's just how much the physical attributes of someone are given assumptions, and then lives are literally ruined. These assumptions are then gone on to make massive assumptions about what these people have done are they cheating the system they're hiding away from things there's a conversation to be had once the ioc is able to prove that t 
testosterone has actually major benefits if you go unless it's you know pre-male puberty has major benefits they haven't had those results which is why Casta Semenya is still in the court and it's at the highest level of the Swiss um, commission right now you know still waiting to hear back but I just think you need to assume the best not the worst straight away and I think it's these aren't people that are breaking world records they've won a couple fights yeah, well, I think that's the main thing you mentioned. Um, and that's my entire thing about the entire thing is that neither of these people have been, I mean, they're still both in, but Iman Khalif, for example, is boxed before in Tokyo, didn't do very well. And it's the standard thing of nobody's got, nobody gives a shit while they're, you know, losing. And as soon as they win, all of a sudden, you know, all these stories come up and it's completely not backed up by science. Um, I think the whole Angela Carini thing, you know, I've never been boxed so hard before. You watched that fight. She did not. Her technique was awful. Her hands were over here. She got blasted in the face because she couldn't protect herself. And then yeah. she quit. Like, and she did, no, she did apologize, to be fair. And yeah, she, did. Well, she had to because she came out and yeah. she just regurgitated something that was given to her as an excuse yeah. that was like dang on the front of it like no just say this because you know this is a narrative and then realize that actually there's not a narrative like that um and, and I think that's the main the, thing the public reaction just to jump at calling them a trans woman is just ridiculous that that's i think that's my biggest frustration and it's just the she isn't. Everyone knows she's not. Where is that? Where is that founded off of? You know, she. You have to show your birth certificate, and she has displayed that. Like, what do you need to prove? And it's been such a gray area with Custer, and the IOC have just dealt with it so poorly. The fact that Custer, by the law, could have competed in this boxing event just shows how loose and lack of understanding they actually have they haven't been able to prove that even in custom scenario that she actually has an advantage they've got very very shady research that they've said and they've used which is now being fought and continues to be fought but custer only was banned for the 400 to the 800 yeah. she could have oh to the one five so she could have run the 5k but essentially body couldn't change that much and she had kind of made peace with it which is why she didn't continue to compete but how, you are saying you're protecting the sport, but you're not. You're just choosing to isolate incidents when it's convenient to you. And that's my big frustration with it. It'll be interesting to see. They're both in the semifinal now. Perhaps one of them wins. I think there'll be an even bigger outcry. But until I think, the for me, the Olympic Committee and any other sporting committee can confirm that there is you know solid evidence behind... Um, you know, the research of the DSD mm. um, people to suggest that it is completely unfair, then I can't, I, I, it's, it's baffling to me. That's just, I think that's just my personal opinion. If, the, if that science changes and they can prove that, then that's a conversation that can be had down the road. Yeah, no, I think that's the main thing. Let's get the science right and then, and then we'll go from there. Because at the moment it's just speculation and people are just doing their own things and it all sounds very um unsubstantiated but yeah so we'll wait tomorrow to how that goes and my next mm. week we'll know if there is a gold medal and stuff like that um but very quickly dan um it is that time of the show let's go on to some predictions we are predicting south Africa versus, uh, versus west indies test cricket we've got the box game this weekend and we're going to predict curtis stain's place so lots to predict let's start with the cricket um we usually do a, a margin a, a run margin and a wicked margin so uh Let's yeah. go three, two, one. SA or West Indies by how many runs uh, first? Okay, I'm ready when you are, Contestant. Okay, okay, let's go. Three, two, one. SA by eight. By one fifty. One fifty. Big. Dan's got oh. big. Dan's got oh. big. I'm going a bit more conservative. Okay. And oh. Wicked Stevie, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Three. Two, one, five. Essay by four. Yeah, I say. Okay. Essay by four, essay by five. So we've actually kind of gone on the inverse there. Um, okay, CB, let's go on to the box versus Australia. First game of the rugby championship. Massive in setting, really getting that first win. Yeah. You got a score in mind? I do. Or a points difference, rather? I do. Okay. I've also got mine. Okay, you know, shall I count in? Okay, three, two, one. Box, box by, by 17. 12. 
Okay. I think I think that's a pretty confident. good shot. I'm just yeah, well, it's both both company. I think you know we've obviously also got um, recent history to deal with. It's a weird one. I don't know. We seem to go straight in fear play rugby. Hopefully, yeah. this is the week that all changes. Yeah, it, I, I never predict us to lose in Australia, but somehow we still manage to. <laughs> okay, and finally, Gerda Stein's final marathon um, placing. Where yeah. do, do you have a, a place in mind for that, Stevie? I do. I do. Okay. As do I. I'll count us in. Three, two, one. 17. 14. Ooh, in and around the teens. In and around the teens. Well, everyone, thank you very much for the show. Hopefully, we don't draw this one again and we actually get closer to that forfeit because it's been a long time yeah. coming. We're probably going to have to shorten that score for next time. Um, yeah. But everyone, thank you very much for watching. I know it was a long show, but jeepers, South African athletes are performing. What do, we, what do you want us to do? Not speak about it, you know? We Correct. have to, we have yeah. to run our miles. We're out operating out there. And I hope you enjoyed this thing. Please do smash a like on the podcast, the video, wherever you happen to watch this and share it with someone who you also think will enjoy it. And by doing so, you will grow South African sport and its reach and investment and things you love to see, isn't it? 100%. Cool. Thanks, Dan. Everybody else have a great weekend. Enjoy the bot game and the rest of the Olympics as well as Test Cricket. And we'll see you guys all next week.